Marco Bazzani, author of Liberty, State, and Union, Political Theory of Thomas Jefferson. You teach political theory at uh, University of Milano. You've come to Auburn to visit. It's a pleasure to have you here today. We're going to be talking about Jefferson. Um, why is this book, in your view, so necessary? Doesn't everybody already know about Jefferson? You know, what really triggered me, triggered my interest on Thomas Jefferson is uh, that he became um, a super icon of the, the left. And uh, believe it or not, you know, there's still, while we're talking, there are articles and books coming out arguing this over and over again, that Thomas Jefferson is the real American liberal on the verge of socialist. You know, sometimes you read stuff on Thomas Jefferson and you think you're reading stuff on Olaf Palme or, or a social democrat uh, classical. You but know, there are, there are aspects of his thought that would appeal to, um, at least to the American left, right? I mean, the, to the extent that uh, uh, the American left believes in free speech, for example, civil liberties. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's for sure. That's to the American left in the sense that a lot of libertarianism would appeal to the American left. Right. That is, um, we're talking anti-prohibition yeah. and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's not really what that you're better. addressing here. You're no, I'm uh, what the the real things and the core of my book is on uh, Thomas Jefferson and the property rights, basically. And the other topic is on Thomas, I would say, on property rights and states' rights, because that was the most amazing thing. You know, like, it started, it all started with Abraham Lincoln that said that uh, Jefferson understood that there was a fight between the man and the dollar, not f between the man to get a dollar, you know, but <laughs> not between men to, to make dollars, but uh, between the man and the dollar. And that he was that he would side with the man in this amazing battle between the man and the dollar. <laughs> and, uh, it's very difficult to explain, and of course, um, Lincoln didn't even try to do that. So that um, that 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 it all started. Then it went on in the '30s during the New Deal, and a lot of books uh, just argued that uh, Thomas Jefferson was the Frank Franklin Roosevelt of the time. And uh, so it's... Uh... But now, uh, your argument is a, a radical argument. You, you say that uh, Jefferson was a, a kind of progenitor of libertarian... Um, I would uh, say uh, conservative uh, slash libertarian. It depends on, uh, on a lot of things. But certainly he was... Uh, it's not a radical argument. It's a scholarly argument. You know, it's, um, I would, uh, I'm not interested in using Thomas Jefferson in contemporary America. I think that's, uh, that's, I mean, some people might want to use his quotations, even my book, to do that if they think they can save this country. <laughs> they're, uh, they're more than welcome to do that. So you, so but that's, you, my that's point is only scholarly. Yeah. That's, uh, there's nothing beyond that. And I'm just, uh, sometimes, you know, I just uh, uh, used my ink, as, uh, as the old uh, saying goes, or my computer against other scholars, but it was only to make a scholarly point. You know, there's nothing ideological about it. And I thought their point was quite ideological. You know, they made it Jefferson a liberal, but there's not an instance in Thomas Jefferson's writings in which he advocates government not big government, just government or the state at all to do anything. But sometimes only you could make an exception for education, he could. But we're talking about with the ward republic or the county level, state level, nothing federal or education. He just wanted, he was a man of the enlightenment. He wanted to enlighten the populace. So he was ready to accept a little bit of government intervention for that. But uh, other than that, I didn't see anything in... You see, uh, my point in the whole book is on property rights and states' rights. And Jefferson was very big on the natural origins of property rights, which is denied by most scholars, and on the union as a compact between the states. And uh, you see, there's um, this uh, great Jefferson, Jeffersonian uh, who, who wrote the most important six-book biography of Thomas Jefferson, 
started, I think the first book was published in 1948. The last one was in uh, 1982 or something. So we're talking about a long research. And his name is uh, Jumaa Malone, a southern man himself, I believe from Mississippi. But when he comes to the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, a very important document if you want to understand Jefferson's thought on the Union and the states. He devotes six pages to the whole incident, you know, out of maybe a grand total of three or four thousand pages on the biography of the man. And it's probably the most important single document ever produced by Thomas Jefferson's other Besides, of course, the Declaration of Independence. But your agenda here in this book is not just purely to debunk uh, prevailing uh, uh, conventions concerning the Jeffersonian thought, but to uh, but to cast Jefferson in uh, in his proper place in the history of liberty, too, right? And how would you assess that? Yeah, that's you're right. This is to me is very important. In fact, I I think I called. I said there's. Uh, I want to. I want to quote myself correctly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to misquote. Well, at least myself. All right. Yeah, the first chapter is called Thomas Jefferson, Icon of a Vanished Republic. So, and I guess the end of the book says something that uh, a lot of Jeffersonian scholars will not like. But all right, I said Jefferson's America may perhaps be born again at any moment. Indeed, as the shining city upon a hill in political rhetoric, it has never died. But with regard to historical reality, it vanished forever at Gettysburg. Uh -huh. So this is my place for Thomas Jefferson's political thought would be from colonial times to independence up to the war between the states or the Civil War, as you want to call it. But no more than that. After the age of Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson was of no use for this country. Now, Jefferson had a, uh, a major place in um, the founding period, um, uh, but it kept having Jeffersonianism kept having to reassert itself again and again after the passage of the Constitution. Do you discuss the the Constitution and his views sure. on this matter here? Yeah, there's well. Thomas Jefferson, th th there are some scholars, one, uh, one of them, he's a very good scholar. I mean, his name is Peter Onuf. And uh, he even wrote an article called uh, Thomas Jefferson Federalist. <laughs> now, if you read his thoughts on the Constitution, you would maybe write an article, Thomas Jefferson Anti-Federalist, <laughs> because he was siding with the critics of the Constitution. But, of course, there's a famous letter in which he says, well, I'm not... I will never be one of those two, either a federalist or an anti-federalist, because they are parties, and parties divide people. So he was against that. But he was against the Constitution. He made it very clear. He got a copy of the Constitution when he was a minister in France, and he criticized it from the beginning to the end. You know, so would, it's very would history have turned out differently if he had been in the United States at that during that period of time. There is um. There is another important scholar whose name is Forrest MacDonald, and um, he wrote in a book, he said, we were very lucky in 1787 that most of the radicals of 76 were not in the country and not in the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> you know, so most of the people that were there, supposedly they were just uh, lawyers, common people ready to compromise, and that's why we could have. My, well, my impression is that uh, we could have gotten pretty well with the Articles of Confederation, <laughs> but, uh, but of course. Well, there, 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 most uh, students of American government have, have a clueless about the subject, about this gulf that separates the Declaration from the Constitution. They just assume maybe they were just one was drafted on Monday and the other on Tuesday, something like that. <laughs> really, yeah, it's about 10 American years, you know, <laughs> 10, 11 years. It's yeah. a decade of uh, blood and... And actually, there is uh, another scholar, Donald Lutz, who, who wrote a very important article, quote, trying to find out who the, the sources for the various decades of, uh, in colonial times and as well as in revolutionary American and the con constitutional period. Now, in the revolutionary America, the number one source was John Locke, quoted, misquoted, anything, but, you know, always there. 
And uh, guess who was uh, the number one source during the constitutional times? Montesquieu, right? So the gulf in political thought that separates John Locke and Montesquieu is what separates the Constitution and the Revolution. And uh, Jefferson himself drew very strongly from Locke, and you go yes. into this. Um, very, I consider yeah. Jefferson a, just a, a radical Lockean. Yeah. He would just uh, radicalize most of Lockean formulas, and uh, it's... Uh, you even mentioned uh, uh, Count de Stute de Tracy in here, which I was pleased yeah, to see. Yeah, he used... Um, well, he was um, not uh, so much well-versed in economics as uh, a lot of people might uh, think, you know, because Thomas Jefferson's got to be like uh, the best man of his time yeah. and everything. But now he read Turgot, right? He yeah, you know, he was, uh, he was definitely very, he read everything that came out. His library was, as most of our listeners probably know, like the, the beginning of the Library of Congress. He donated it because he had a lot of debts. And uh, so actually it was not a real donation, but uh, it was the beginning of the Library of Congress. And you can, you can take a look at his library and he, he had all the books that uh, an intellectual. And you could do worse than reading Turgot and, and De Stute de Tracy for economics. Right. Now, uh, we should talk about some of the myths that surround Jefferson. One of the things I should just mention in, in, in light of this is a, a very pervasive view that Jefferson favored um, agriculture over industry as, uh, as that's a, no uh, no that's uh well you know he was all he loved the, the classics you know beginning with greek he could read of course greek latin uh, all sorts of languages he was not very proficient even in, uh, in french he could not speak very well but he could read any language latin languages especially didn't read german um which was was not uh, required reading for an intellectual in those days. It will become just la later on. So he was, um, there's, there's a, like a black hole for the German world, but uh, considering Jefferson, but he knew everything else, you know, from uh, the ancient uh, Saxon uh, to all sorts of languages. So given that, he just um, had a penchant for the good life of agriculture. He just thought uh, that um, you had to be a farmer. To, to have a good living, but he didn't have, other than that, he didn't have a profession of faith for agriculture over other trades at all. You know, he just, um, there, there's, there are a lot of letters that I quote that, uh, so there's, uh, in this sense, uh, he just didn't favor agriculture over trade at all or over any other kind of industry. That's, uh, that's just a misconception. Right. Uh, well, and of course, there's this rendering of 19th century American history that somehow uh, pits the struggle between agriculture and industry and then has Jefferson favoring the agricultural view. But this is just a distortion. What are some other... Well, no, that, that happened, I think, later on. That was uh, part of the tradition, uh, I'll take my stand, uh, yeah. that's part of that's, right. that's, uh, yeah, that's yeah. southern revivalist movement and so they wanted uh, which uh, which I think it's a little bit uh, not not very easy to defend let's right. put it this interesting way. The yeah, right. interesting <laughs> from the historical point of view and they of course wanted to use Thomas Jefferson as yeah. their mentor but uh, wrong one yeah. no, what didn't. are some other myths about Jefferson that you want to address to me the most amazing one is the Union lover <laughs> that's that is the most amazing thing. Well, I would say two of these. Well, the first one is that Jeffersons did not did not Jefferson did not believe that uh, property rights were natural natural rights, and this is the most amazing thing because he said it all over and over again. Actually, talking about falsif falsifying history on uh, Jefferson is really a case study. There there are some um, some guys who just uh, wrote. Uh, scholars in the 1920s who just quoted Tom Paine and then uh, they just thought it was a letter by Thomas Jefferson and said this is Thomas Jefferson on property but it was Tom Paine actually and then you know they published another book and I'm talking about Gilbert Chouinard did that four years later and said I'm sorry like four years ago in this edition I published a letter on property and um, 
I mistakenly, I got the, you know, I, I just, uh, I had a letter from Tom Paine and I thought it was Thomas Jefferson's. I reproduced the letter right here because although it was written by Tom Paine, it is exactly what Thomas Jefferson thought about property rights, right? Can you imagine that? <laughs> Instead of just saying, I'm sorry, <laughs> I made a mistake. <laughs> and so that's say, yeah, all right, it was not Thomas Jefferson, it was Tom Paine, but still, you know, because... The whole story is that Thomas Jefferson just did not believe in property rights as, you know, just natural rights in the Lockean sense. While, not only I make the point, but I think I really show it pretty much conclusively that he did. Yes. And uh, so that would be the first one. And the second one is the lover of the Union, mm -hmm. the Union lover. This is uh, a myth that it's, uh, it's really this ghost count against the evidence. Now, do you come to terms with what, what uh, many people have noticed as a striking difference between Jefferson, the, the theorist, and the writer, the man of letters, um, the, the libertarian, and Jefferson, the president? Because uh, here we have... Uh, well, yeah. In fact, you know, I, I think I say it at the end of the book. I, this book is about Jefferson as... Um, Political, Jefferson's political thought, poli you know, and political theory. So I stop short when he gets into the presidency. So he was, you could say, he was uh, a conservative slash libertarian, and then he became president. And then, you know, stop right there. But you see, the thing is, the other real force that was, that drove his life was a love for peace, peace above all. Like the big mistake of the embargo was because he wanted to avoid the war. And he would have done anything to keep America out of any single war. Yeah. And that's very different from uh, modern conservatives yes. or modern liberals, you know, from any, anybody in the political spectrum of the 1900s or this century. Now, when you say peace, you don't, you don't mean just with uh, internationally, but also a, a general view of re concerning peace in, in society. Definitely. Between the individuals and communities. Yeah, and he just, he just uh, believed that uh, the more you diffuse power, mm -hmm. uh, the more peaceful you get. And the more you concentrate power. Actually, you could argue that the whole fight of Thomas Jefferson was against the modern state and the modern state agenda of just, which is very simple. I mean, we all discuss, read, we pretty much know everything about the modern state, but if you take a look at the modern state, there's only one big point in the agenda, which is concentration of power at any given center. And um, so the rest compared to this is just, you know, sub projects. But, you know, it's like would be like a major and a minor, <laughs> you know, that, like the major project is the concentration of power. And, and wouldn't, you, wouldn't you say that, that that's the part of Jefferson's legacy that's the most lasting? I mean, when you think about Jefferson's it, influence it around be, the world. If it would be. I mean, if it, yeah, I don't know if it really endures, but, you know, it could be the most lasting part of the Jeffersonian legacy, you know, to the disperse and diffuse power so much that it's not in the hands of the few, the many, one single person, or all the people. Right. Well, and we're, we're, he said we're, it in these exact words. We're sitting here, we're, as we're talking, we've got there's a remarkable events going on in Egypt right now. Um, so there's another aspect to the, to the influence too. I mean, it's who are you gonna draw on and what are you gonna draw on if you're, if you're tired of the government and you believe you have the right to uh, overthrow that government, replace it with something else. Um, it's going to be the Declaration of Independence, right? I mean, not just right. here, but ar around the world. Yeah, I think, so. well, if you go back, I wouldn't suggest, I wouldn't be able, at least, to suggest any other political doctrine for uh, revolutionaries around the world, you know, government based on consent, as little as possible, of not a government, not of consent. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> and right. the opposite, you know, we got big government and little consent. Right. We should have very little government or, and uh, a lot of consent for that. And uh, so I think, you know, the Declaration of Independence is uh, 
could still be the basis of a lot of uprisings all over the world, but uh, it's going to be taken seriously at least by Americans, right. first of all, by Americans. And, and red. Uh, and right. red, you know, yeah. Americans and uh, Westerners, Europeans, you know, people that belong to that tradition don't even take it seriously anymore. So how, how do we expect Egyptians <laughs> to right. know about it? Yeah. But the amazing thing, you know, on, on the serious channels that I was watching in this Egyptian thing is that uh, there are a lot of Americans, American journalists that just believe, what do we do about Egypt? <laughs> you know, it's like if Americans could just overturn the destiny of a country in like a couple of days. Yeah, that's right. You and just they say, yeah, give a well, speech. yeah, we gave $28 billion to them in the past 30 years. Yeah, yeah but that was for the Mubarak regime, you know, yeah. now it's different. Yeah. So a lot. Well, uh, and of course, the obsession of the of the American reporters with this idea of democracy. Let's talk about Jefferson democracy. He he, he favored democracy. In what sense? That's, and that's, to what end? Now that we know a lot more about democracy than Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson didn't know much about democracy, right? In those days, he died in eighteen twenty six, the fourth of July. It's amazing, right? Eighteen. Yeah, 1826, yeah. the 4th of July. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. The 50th anniversary that he was invited in Washington, D.C. to give a speech, and he said, well, I'm not feeling too good. <laughs> and so he died the same day. The same day died John Adams. And it's very well known that his last words of John Adams was, but Thomas Jefferson uh, is still alive, but, which was not true because he was dead on the same day. But so the thing is, Thomas Jefferson didn't witness Adolf Hitler being elected during a democratic election, right? He didn't witness this kind of things that uh, we know. You see, I, I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm, I don't, I'll take the fifth, but I'm a smoker, right? So I smoke cigarettes. When I do smoke cigarettes, I read, well, Surgeon General has determined that it's bad for your health, and that's understandable. I do take a risk. When I go to the ballots, and being Italian and American, I could go to the ballots almost every day, right? Because <laughs> there's always an election going on <laughs> if I really wanted to. And so when I go to the ballots, I should have a, like, a warning, a surgeon's general warning. Warning. This is a very dangerous thing. Dictators have been elected with this exact instrument, right? So in America, sometimes people are very naive about democracy, elections, and so on. And that Jefferson was a little naive. Je no, all right. So that's that's one part. That's one part was he didn't know as much as we do about democracy. You know the, the bad things that can happen in it. The other thing is, all right. So he just thought that the people were the best guardians of their own natural rights, mm -hmm. right? So that part is still very much understandable, and uh, would subscribe to that point of view. You know, that's uh, who else? Right. Well, the people themselves. But you see, he had a, another conception of democracy. When we think about democracy, there's, there's nothing more than more than one party, right. ballots, right. and votes, and people that go there, line up, stand up. The more people they vote, and the more democratic is the election, and like in America, there are a lot of elections, then no more than the turnout is like 25% or so on. And but crucially, so, whatever the results of democracy, you have to be happy with them. You have to, you have no grounds to complain whatsoever because after all, you have a democracy. Therefore, everything's fixed up. Yeah, but that's, there are a lot of things in which the people are not allowed to vote. You know? So it's not like uh, there are so many things that uh, in, in America and in Switzerland, because of the federalist origins of the countries, of both the countries, the people still can vote on a larger issues and a lot of things like, but for instance, in Europe, sometimes the people just uh, vote the wrong way and then they have another election. That thing happened several times in the European Union, you know, that they rejected the European constitution and they, they had to vote again. That happened 10 years ago. Then uh, like the French voted against it and that was uh, six or seven years well, ago. In fact, you have, this, you have this whole nation state apparatus that's not subject to any kind of democratic control whatsoever. I mean, you've got a kind of gloss of leadership on top. 
And you have the elite. The elite controls what is respectable in the political spectrum. And uh, what I think Thomas Jefferson would have considered the political spectrum uh, we have nowadays really narrow, you know, because it is. I mean, what, uh, let's say, what, what do you go to from Hillary Clinton to, well, just name somebody on the respectable right. I don't know. I don't know. I don't keep up with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't, keep up. I don't know if there is a respectable uh, what about, right. What about uh, the That's slogan the, that uh, Jefferson is the, the great prophet of equality in whatever way you want to use that term? Well, you see, Jefferson, some, if, you, if you take a look at the, the real, uh, the whole thing, states' rights, Jefferson is as important or even more important than uh, John C. Calhoun in his own times. It was, it just, and it was important, but uh, the whole thing was started by Jefferson. So all the major arguments. So why is John Calhoun considered like, very objectionable, not part of the American political tradition, and Thomas Jefferson is. For one simple thing, equality. And Thomas Jefferson defended, at least theoretically, he never freed a slave in his life, and he owned several hundred. But, you know, at least theoretically, he was ashamed of himself as a slave owner. And on the other hand, um, John Calhoun was not. Well, maybe deep inside he was, but he never confessed anything like that. So he was, I would say that on the moder you know, on, uh, few, on moral grounds, uh, Thomas Jefferson was definitely correct, although in his practical life. So he was, he was arguing for equality. There is no doubt about that. Equality of all human beings is, we all agree upon that. And, and no by which he meant equality of, of rights, yeah. uh, having nothing to do with the redistribution of no, income. No, no, of course. Actually, he, he argues, and uh, even in his presidential speeches, uh, first one, second one, against the distribution of wealth, one person to the other. You know, the wealth comes to earth already distributed, and this, there's nothing the state can do about it. That's he makes it very clear. It's, it's not all of Palmer. <laughs> it's Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. It's, um, it, so as a as a as a symbol of uh, so you continue to use the word uh, liberalism in a in a way that implies statism. We should make make clear. I mean, but, right. but there is a liberalism that represents a a, a kind of the foreshadowing of liber modern libertarianism. Yeah, but in in the alternatives that were posed to Americans and Westerners everywhere. In the 1900s, on one side there is the market, on the other side there is the state. The market is working for the bourgeoisie, the state is working for the working class, right? So that was somewhat a little bit of the social, what the social democrats thought in Austria and uh, Germany and so on, and that's something that penetrated very deeply into the culture of the American left and the European left in general. You know, you could use the state against capitalism because capitalism in itself is unjust, unfair. You know, there's something not fair about it. And uh, so in this sense, it would be very difficult to use Thomas Jefferson from the leftist point of view, if you consider this part of the left. But from the other side, you know, you just uh, the whole thing. The we were talking as uh, I, I mentioned the Kentucky Resolutions of yes. 1798, and the whole battle started for a free speech. You know, <laughs> the whole thing started uh, as uh, we would call it a First Amendment right or a First Amendment case right now because uh, of the Alien and Sedition laws that were passed on the Fourth of July, actually of. Uh, 1798. A lot of things happened on the 4th of July. <laughs> Not only fireworks, you know. Yeah. Right. Um, and these laws, uh, restricted speech, if you speak yeah. out against the government, then it's off with your head. Jefferson. Uh, yeah, it was amazing. You know, so these laws would be considered uh, really totally unconstitutional nowadays in the United States. And it was really amazing. It was part of the French scare. You know, that uh, they just thought that the Jacobins were going to be all over this country and coming with all the immigrants. And, uh, and so they restricted so uh, the criticism. Criticism of the president could, uh, could really bring you to jail. 
and uh, anybody you know though who had a newspaper and uh, hosted a an article on the president that uh, was not apologetic uh, would uh, risk to go to jail. There were, there's a Thomas Cooper guy who spent like uh, 25 months in jail for that. So that was a serious law and who, that threatened uh, free speech in America. And that's how he started to interpret the Constitution uh, in a different way, Thomas Jefferson. So the, that the Kentucky resolutions were considered part of the Constitution by Southerners until 1865 when they were showed a different Constitution, but uh, mm -hmm. Lincoln's Constitution. Yes, right. um, and all the liberals of that period, all the, 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 the true believers in liberty rallied around Jefferson. There was this tremendous uh, upset uh, in 1800, just overthrew all the Hamiltonians and everything they represented. Yeah, because somewhat, you know, they just thought that free speech was against the consolidation of the Union. It is, isn't it amazing that our free speech liberals nowadays, they just want as much union as possible to defend free speech, right? So they think the states would... Uh, you see, the, the whole story was about the, the amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights that was passed couple of years later, uh, two years later, 1791, of course. And so from the beginning up to the Civil War, the whole idea was that the Bill of Rights, all the amendments, were against the Union, or just to stop the Union from becoming a real modern state in the European sense, the center of power. And with Lincoln, after the Civil War, the idea was quite different. The threats to liberty don't come from the Union. They come from other people, you know. So it would be like uh, what John Paul Sartre said, the hell is the others, you know. So it comes from other private people, private persons, but not from the government. And if it comes from the government, basically state governments, as you can see during uh, the New Deal, of course, and uh, or Reconstruction, before that, and then if you could see during the desegregation period in America, it was large minorities within a state that had to fight against the majority of a state, and they had to use the union for moral reason, although it was unconstitutional. So it is a different, a totally different view of the Bill of Rights to curtail the power of the union, of the federal government, before 1865. On the other hand, to protect individuals from interaction with other individuals after 1865. Thereby strengthening the central government. Right. So, so and the, the union, and actually the whole idea of Lincoln was that freedom was based on the correct interaction with the federal union, mm -hmm. right? So you could, you could get that. It was not given, you know, a nature given right. Yeah. Well, how do you account for the fact that, uh, that Jefferson um, has, uh, survived as a politi political icon in American history if his views are so contrary to practically everything that's happened, uh, you know, over the last uh, century and a half? You know, there, there's a great book called uh, The Jeffersonian Image, and that's how it, it survived, as an image. And after all, he survived, well, there's one reason he never wrote well, he wrote one book, and uh, so, so he wrote a lot of letters, things, documents, and a lot of things that could be quoted and could be considered um, even pamphlets at a certain point that were circulating among his friends and they were published and so on, but he never wrote a whole book. You know, you cannot nail him down with uh, one published right. thing. Uh, he just wrote, well, when the single book was uh, The Notes in the State of Virginia, and he didn't want it to be published. It was first translated into French, then retranslated into English, and then he didn't like, well, thing is, he didn't like the translation, then he had the, the original published a few years later, but that was uh, in the 80s. So it's, it's a great book. No doubt about that. But, but he never had a meta he never had wrote a manifesto. No, the manifesto would be the Declaration of Independence, and of course, yeah. but uh, you know, there's there's so so many things yeah. that uh, the Congress 
put into the Declaration of Independence that uh, already, you know, you see that uh, Jefferson is not really in one single document, but I would suggest that the first one would be the Declaration and the second one, the Kentucky Resolutions, are the most important uh, things. That yeah, that's what people should read produced. when they read Jefferson. After, and then, of course, next, if you want to find out about Jefferson, read your book. Yeah. Uh, what, about, uh, what about Albert J. Knox? Uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good biography more than anything else. It's, it's not, doesn't go on too much into the political stuff. But he does understand the, the point about federalism. Sure. And that's pervasive. Through yeah. That. So it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good book. It's very good. Did you tell uh, the people the, the actual uh, title of the book in yeah, case they... I, I think I did well, at the beginning, Liberty, Liberty, State, and Union, right. Political Theory of Thomas Jefferson. It's, it came out just last year from Mercer yeah. University Press. It, and you said it was a three years in review, and then finally it kind of yeah. came out on the other end. Um, the Mises store doesn't carry yeah, so, it just yeah. yet. I'm I'm sorry, you, as you see, you know, it's, a, it's an old manuscript because the last work quoted was, uh, comes to, that's, I guess it's 2007, but uh, okay. it's not my fault. You know. <laughs> We've got uh, 25 pages of footnotes here, a vast bibliography. Um, uh, I haven't read it, but from what I've read in it, the language is, is compelling, it's accessible. Um, you're really trying to uh, give a different portrait of Jefferson than uh, you find in most of the academic world today. Yeah, and I do actually. I would like to apologize to some scholars that I, I, I probably I tried to use language, um, you know, as much to be subtle as much as possible. But sometimes I had to attack them for their views on Jefferson. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, and I'm, I received some emails from from these people and say, "Well, why do you say that? This and that." And I do want to apologize with you guys all, and I don't think you were ideological at all. I just uh, <laughs> I just had, you know, it's, it's part of my bad habit, you know, to be sometimes very polemic. Um, there was uh, one thing that when I, Eisenhower was president, uh, he, he was uh, having a dinner, and um, so there was this um, British lady who noticed that uh, his his language was not presidential, to say the least. The uh -huh. way he talked, it was a general, right? And so he, since that she told um, the wife, his wife, uh, well, would you not please try to help your husband not to say manure? Because, you know, and he said, well, that took me along, you know, to teach him not to say the other word, but that, <laughs> and so that. <laughs> You should be congratulated. Right, so I'm um, really, yeah, that's yeah. my manure. Yeah, yeah. Um, just one more thing is, do you have an edition of this book out in Italian too? Yes, uh, it's not the same book. It's a longer one because uh, writing in Italian on Thomas Jefferson, you have to explain a lot more things. Yeah. You know, okay. As you so can it's imagine, it's not a familiar figure to a lot of Italians, and you would be amazed that there's not a single biography of Thomas Jefferson ever written in Italian. How is that book done in Italy? Yeah, pretty, pretty well. I mean, it's a scholarly book, so, you know, they don't say. Are we expecting this to come out in paperback soon? We hope so. I hope so, you know, at least uh, it would be. It's, it's not too expensive. So. No, it's a good price. I think it's something like twenty-five dollars. I saw, so that's wonderful for a hardback book. Um, uh, Professor Bazzani, thank you so much for writing this book and for coming and being with us today, and for giving us a new view of Jefferson. And I would say that it comes just in time for for us and for the world. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Anytime. <laughs>